increase 4.7. Right. Run it once and then switch right. to using your version of solution. That, that was my question. Because it causes great. some confusion. Like that was I, I could answer this one. I thought, there, I thought I saw a ticket actually to remove all that oh, stuff really? that was created the last month. So, see. Yeah, so good. So all the current stuff. Yeah. All, all the current stuff is in Sage NP, not Sage. So, yeah. So Sage NP is a is a link. So Sage NP is a link to uh, whatever whatever you want to make it uh, to a Sage NB, to a Sage Notebook um, folder. Can you make that description page available publicly somewhere? Could Which you the, the page we were looking at from your Sage Notebook. Your slides should be on the... This, you should post your slides to the wiki. Yes. Well, that one there is really... Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll put it on the wiki. And, yeah. Yeah. Actually... But the worksheets are will work on anything. Our worksheet format hasn't changed ever really, okay. or much. Yeah. Right, so in the data, you can find the JMO, the JSMAS, so all the libraries we ship with are in the, this folder. And then uh, this should be a separate point. Uh, the notebook folder where the actual current running worksheets and all this the, uh, file storage data is in the home directory dot sage, sage notebook, so be by default. Yeah. Of course, you can start notebook with a parameter telling which folder. Directory. So that's the part you're talking about, whether it goes in the database or not, basically? Yeah, this, exactly. So this is what you want yeah. to be that in the one, database. That directory with all its subdirectories, that entire thing would be replaced by one single database. Yeah. Okay. And, all right, so how we have, uh, so for testing, I, I didn't, I brought my mini computer, so I didn't have time to do a demo of how to use the Selenium test suite. But uh, there are actually already, it's very useful. Uh, I ran through it a few times to get all the Flask rewrite uh, bugs ironed out. So this is functional testing. Uh, so what it does is you, I can do a demo if people are interested uh, sometime this week about it. But what it does is, uh, if you haven't seen it, it injects a little JavaScript which drives your browser basically. Mm -hmm. And you can go through uh, functional testing where it's like somebody's clicking around the web page in the browser, so it's very real. Like you get like the real thing. You're not you're not uh, making a fake URL request. You just it's a JavaScript. It's it's it is a it's pretending it's a user basically clicking around and doing what you want it to do. So we have already we already have like I think 20, 20 or thirty tests there. So uh, that's very useful if somebody's clicking around the notebook. After a while, run through this testing, um, or ask me how to set it up and run it. And then for stress testing, we don't have a standard thing. I use this grinder, which I showed the pictures of. Uh, Jason uses some, and different people use different things. But uh, yeah, so uh, we don't have a standard. But uh, if you want to do some stress testing, talk to one of us. And we can show you how to set it up. So, so the stress testing, it just simulates this URL request very fast, but it does not, right? So then if you have some weird JavaScript bug, that's not going to catch that, right? So that's just for stress testing. So you use the functional testing, if you change the functionality and stress testing to make sure it's scared and so on. And class also has testing just using uh, wisdom. So you can make calls to uh, make So here's some short and goes. I, I mean, yeah, I came up with this uh, something uh, something coordinated, but uh, <laughs> so it's not exclusive. Or, uh, so basically, some of the things that you can think about working on, and this will overlap with the projects 
So there's a very annoying disappearing text bug. I think a bunch of people can can testify how annoying it is. Uh, so some text cells once in a while become input cells. Uh, I don't know how to describe it better, but when you see it, you know it. Uh, and there, there has been. It, it's very hard to reproduce. That's why it hasn't been fixed yet. But uh, there's different accounts, so maybe somebody can put them all together and try to get to the bottom of it. Uh, we have to finalize this flask version basically just to ship it to the next, next Sage. Uh, sage and Beetle.org has to be moved to Flask. Uh, under, just understanding the scalability issues better, uh, LDAP integration, NGX integration. Long-term goals, uh, so there's something that Jason's going to talk about, which is this one, one, uh, one, cell, one cell worksheet. So that, that was the purpose of that was uh, just to start thinking about like a better protocol. And uh, Jason will tell us. So what happened in January, there was a brainstorming session where we tried to design a better protocol to communicate with the Sage server. Because right now, the Sage server really expects to be talking to the notebook. But there's no, there's no reason why, why it should be doing that. Right now, for example, the, the server will be spitting out HTML formatted things, whereas uh, ideally you want to just get the JSON data and then you do your own formatting on the, on the client side. So uh, I think uh, this what what happened is uh, Jason Brown to uh, try to imp what the, this one cell server now has uh, is instead of trying to rewrite this big web app using a new protocol we we just they, they just uh, rewrote a, a mini web app using only one cell but using this more advanced protocol which will be easier for extension and uh, IPython is moving to Again, similar type of idea where IPython would have a you would have a, a server and a client talking through some JSON protocol. So uh, I think some ideas some ideas from there will be taken, or maybe just using their protocol. But uh, in any case, this has to happen because that would make it easier for uh, all these custom widgets and all these things to be done on the client side, and the Sage is just a computing server, and uh, so there are some notes in this. Uh, you go to this URL. There are notes about this brainstorming. Okay. Uh, the JavaScript currently used in a notebook. I think last time I talked to Tom Goodby, he said that he's not very proud of it. <laughs> he's a web. His, his words were he was a web 1.0 developer. So. It works, but he thinks it should be rewritten, basically. And uh, what it, it, he said he had a hard time getting with cross-browser compatibility issues, and I think nowadays uh, libraries like jQuery can uh, alleviate that. And uh, he, I, th I think he used jQuery for any of that. So you know, sometimes the, just doing shift enter on different browsers, it's interpreted differently, but the libraries, which I think solve this much better. Yeah, I don't think jQuery existed. Yeah, at the beginning, exactly. in like January. And right now, we're still using the old solution. Yeah. So uh, that's something that hasn't been touched. It's also served a little bit weirdly, where it's it's not served statically. Mm. There's uh, the, yeah, the JavaScript. Uh, it gets some some things get injected into a JavaScript. It gets generated every single time, which is kind of bizarre. It should be the, the settings should be gotten through a separate channel, which would speed up load up loading times and so on. Uh, the visuals, I, I don't know if anybody here is a visual type of person, but I think to be improved. Uh, just looking at this, it's not very visually pleasing. Uh, too many different elements and so on. <laughs> so if somebody is a CSS are there, group. Are there people interested in uh, being able to collapse some of the sections and so on? So when, uh, you can do that. Yes. About the mathematical notebook. Can you do that now? You can do that, yeah. Uh, 
you can collapse them one at a time, yeah, but you can't, you can't put them in outlines and collapse whole sections. We are very interested in that. Yes. Yeah, there's yeah. interest. I mean, that's the, one of the nice things about the Mathematica notebook, and yeah. I don't know how important it would be for research collaboration, but for yeah. the students, it's, uh, it's, I think, quite useful. The, the main problem behind that right now um, is you have to decide on basically some way within the um, the worksheet format to represent those sections um, and then render them. So primarily it's a question of like, like CSS or JavaScript together might do it and it just might be HTML. Yeah, but you need to decide what you're going to call a section. How do we store text yeah. versus what's a cell and then how do we, right now all we do is say a bunch of HTML then some delimiters and there's a cell of input code. Yeah. And then a bunch of HTML stuff. So I think what Mike's saying is we need to have some more structure to the format. The so, so here's how the worksheet work looks right now on the server. This yeah. is how it looks like. Uh -huh. And then whenever, this is the what you write with uh, okay. with the uh, with the DynamC and then uh, I think it's once in a while. So you, you're not using a lot of divs and things, the higher order structure that's no. available now. It's and, and using that, well, well, first you have to decide what you want to group together. But yeah. Yeah. Well, there is. There's, there's, that's pretty div structure, each cell and then the return cell, and the I output is a separate div and so on, isn't it? When it's so rendered, rendered it's, the structure is there, it just isn't that's not this format. That's when it's rendered. That's only in the rendering, right. okay. Yeah. See, I've been working at dealing well, with the JavaScript so what's rendered. Consists of an ordered list of cells. Uh, that's it. Yeah. That's it, that's right. Right, but maybe something which would a certain store. Formatting for the cells is like a wiki formatting, it's not even HTML. The, the way they're delimited is at least. Oh, is not I, I'm, quite I'm the trying to find one to show. It's just in the text representation of the worksheet. Yeah. I think okay. I work with. In memory, that's. I mean, in, the, in memory, it's just a list of Python objects that are cells, and some of them are HTML cells, and some of them are compute cells. I do, uh, that's it. Edit? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oops. Oh, and I get all the embedded HTML. <laughs> okay, yeah, oh, that's, I was looking at the wrong thing. Okay, so here it is. Yeah. This is the... So it's a list of blocks like that, interspersed with HTML. Yeah. Okay. Yep. This is the, what you, I enter, this is what Sage output is. And basically it's three braces because in maybe August 2006 we weren't sure if the notebook mark markup format would be HTML or if it would be a wiki. And would it be like the Moin Moin wiki where it's three braces for pre-format or would it be HTML? Uh -huh. And so we thought it was going to be like Moin Moin and a markup format like that and that's why it's three braces instead of some sort of HTML tag to indicate code cells. It would make more sense now to have an you know, HTML tag to indicate code cells rather than triple braces. Because everything else is HTML. But when you're sending it, what if you want to send it to a consumer which is not HTML? What if you want to send it to an iPhone application? Well, it's certainly not going to... Yeah, I understand what you mean. I mean well, HTML is a presentation element. Yeah. Maybe on the server you shouldn't have any presentation element. It's, it's more XML. XML. Okay. Yeah, it's so be XML. XML. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or JSON. JSON. Yeah. JSON. Yeah. Or JSON. Yeah. Just have JSON. Yeah. So with JSON you can send this. JSON would be yet another completely different thing you could do. Right now it's almost XML except for the braces. Yeah. Now it's a weird mix of everything. <laughs> Um, I'm not really familiar with the data formats for the stored data, but what's done with large with large result sets and large mixed data type result sets? So like a big these are array. array. These are these are stored on this. They're stored so on so a worksheet. Yeah, a worksheet is a combination of that particular text right there, which is almost HTML except it has triple brace things in it. And in addition to that, there are a collection of directories, one for each cell, and those directories can contain arbitrary data, any files at all. One directory could have 50 files in it, each of which is 50 gigabytes. And then there's one additional directory, which is called the data directory, which um, is in addition to the directories for each individual cell. Times that works on level yeah. storage. Yeah, right. yeah there's, there's one directory, which is worksheet level storage, and that's what you get when you click on the data tab up there. 
and you'll see there's a there's probably an image when he clicks on that. Um, yeah, so he has a couple of files that are in that directory. Show the SVG. And those are meant to be shared between all cells. So the set itself is not persistent, like only the output is set. So, you know, if you like created this, you know, gigantic graph, um, and then you restart the moment, so we have to recreate the graph. It's the same as the Yeah, but the, the picture of the graph would be saved. Uh -huh. Or if you said save, you could pickle the graph and save that, and then there would be a link to it. And that file that it is linked to would be in one of the directories that corresponds to one of the cells. So, so there's lots of big data that can be stored in addition to this text. And, and moving towards a database, you wouldn't imagine putting that data in a database, or you would imagine definitely it would go in a database. Definitely. Fifty megs of data. Into yeah, database. absolutely. And I think that you data keep those on just files. No, definitely not. There's absolutely no way they would go in the file system. That's interesting you just say do that because one of the issues we've run into on our campus servers uh -huh. is they run a database and the big big data files in the database causing the database problems so they, they now most of that stuff now goes to the large data files and I forget what the cutoff is now goes to the file system. Yeah, it feels like file systems aren't good databases and databases aren't good file systems. Right. Yeah, exactly. So what they did is they sort of figured they have found a happy medium. Well, I definitely wouldn't store these things in a file system. Well, I mean, I mean if, you're, if you're talking 50 gigabytes, it probably should be its own file. 50 megabytes, though. Is that a database size, database size? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I, again, this is something, all I know is from talking to people on my campus that, that that's something they had to worry about. Well, this is one of the advantages of a layer of abstraction. Uh, because, for instance, with MongoDB, it's made for having gigantic files as well. So, yeah, and this is, you know, our campus server uses Plone, and what they've done is Plone puts small stuff in it, and it has also a file system that so automatically Are shunts. Are they so as their database for storing large files? No, they don't. That's the point. That's no, but did they? Um, I think initially, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't really view Zope as a very good database, personally. I mean, I don't know, it's more like a way of storing B-trees on disk, where 10% of them are in memory. And it's really good at that one thing, but it doesn't have any support for building indexes. I mean, it doesn't do, there's a lot of things that databases do that so it doesn't do. Yeah, and I think that, but that's, I think that's part of why the large files are yeah. on a disk now. I think the question depends on the database you're using. Yeah. To whether or not it makes sense. And it, you know, if I'm putting up something like sagenb.org, I can cap the size of files that people are allowed to store it. Mm -hmm. Two megabytes. I'm not going to be storing people's 50 gigabyte files in a database. I'll just do an error on my server. Although right now, if you wanted to make a 50 gig file, it would get started on the file system. Mm -hmm. And then nobody would be able to use SageMB for a while. <laughs> you use all your disk space. Yeah, right? exactly. It would just, that partition would just suddenly be full. Yeah. <coughs> Picture kind of what's Dcat in generic. Uh, the Flask threads right to the database. And then there will be these devices, which do a computation, which again will pull from a database right to the database. And then uh, this, during this time, the, the client will be pulling the database until we get the computation and get it in there. Uh -huh. So and then this, this can add this, this, there was some experimentation with uh, zero MQ how to get these uh, workers and so on. And isn't the single cell thing that Jason's going to talk about? It's almost this architecture. Yeah, already. I'll be talking about this sort of in depth. Yeah, so I'll give a short demo and then go through the. So the, the point of the single cell was the single cell was to not worry about its users and worksheets and cells. Just focus on this method of uh, <coughs> running a computational service. And yeah. Yes, I'll talk about very soon. All right. Uh, just to wrap it up. So. For the future, it would be nice to have uh, widgets for different objects, right? So right now, when you have an image, you get an image. But what if you get a JSON that tells you, oh, I'll be putting an image, and then the client can wrap this image around with some kind of a widget, which allows you to zoom in and out of the image, and so on. Same for matrices and all sorts of math objects. You can imagine uh, some kind of a J uh, JavaScript widget, or if you and again if if you're not in general, if you not, if you do it so generally, then you can do that in a, in a, in a on a different system like an Android or iPhone, and uh, just take the data represented how you want. 
So there's a lot of requests, so I think again, looking at the Sage as a project, it's the most requests that come in are about notebook uh, features. So people want folders and labels for the worksheets, groups of users, and uh, maybe homework submission, grading, and so on. So why am I excited about the notebook? It's browsers are the ultimate virtual machines. So the fastest way to get Sage on any device is uh, to implement it for the browser. Uh, to, that's why the notebook works. I tried the notebook on my Kindle. You can even get something. Uh, it's, it's kind of usable. Uh, I mean, it's, it's usable, the problem is the Kindle keyboard is not thought about having mathematics. So, uh, so it's, uh, there's a big problem with Windows for Sage, but if you have a good notebook, if somebody just wants to play around with uh, Sage, chances are, in, you know, if they're not very technical, they might be, they're probably using Windows, you can say, well, here's a notebook, go play around, and try it, and share a worksheet with them, and so on. You can interact, so you can, you, the notebook lets, you know, it exposes Sage to a lot of people, and uh, that's, that's certainly, makes it exciting. Uh, restrictive licensing, so something like Notebook, it's a unique project that can only, I think, the way it's working right now can only work for open source, for open source uh, uh, computer algebra system because everybody can execute something on a, a remote server. So we don't have to worry about licensing and so on, so we can do this full stuff where we get 100 people using Sage at the same time. All right, the web technologies are great. They're moving ahead. Uh, this graph editor I made before, I think, uh, Chrome came out. It was much slower. Chrome made JavaScript so much faster. Now I, I can do bigger graphs with it, basically as, as big as I can see. And uh, all the other browsers are catching up. So the web technology is definitely up, up for it. So exciting. And then uh, it's a possibility to even the notebook with a little bit, you know, it's, it's a good starting point for some bigger system where it can be used for the classroom. That's what those education people will talk about uh, this, but it's, it's a good starting point for, to building up something bigger to communicate with the students and with people who are interested in doing computations. All right, and uh, oh, this is the state of the notebook, so to <laughs> say what is the state of the notebook. And it's need work. <laughs> it's work. Right. We've had a lot of discussion. Are there any quick questions for Rado? Or anybody else? Or anybody, yeah, right. Okay, let's uh, take five or ten minutes, uh, refresh your snacks, use the bathroom, we'll download his video and we'll get reset for uh, Jason. So exactly how long and when is it? <laughs> like, that was a little vague. I feel like it was vague. About the exact time of the next talk. There's no exact time. How about, no. Five minutes isn't... I don't five think that's enough. not enough. Ten oh, minutes. Oh, five. At the oh, minimum... Ten. That will work for you. People are just going to start talking to each other like crazy the second it stops. That's how yes. Why don't we just start at 12.15? Okay. 12.15. 12.15. Okay. Let's thank Rado again. Oh, okay.